I think we will absolutely have bus rapid transit. We will have a network of bus rapid transit that gets people where they need to go in a way that's efficient, effective, um, safe, uh, you know, great to use and build out a network. You, we can do it in this Commonwealth. We can do it for a fraction of the cost of what it would take for us to build out rail. I'm a big rail fan, but bus rapid transit and really a bus network expansion will enable us not just to deal with inner, you know, neighborhood or inner city tra travel, but also it enables us to address issues where communities have been gentrified, right? I mean, gentrification. And so as you're looking at more people being displaced to suburban and rural areas, we are gonna to have to think about expanding the bus network so that it reaches those people. So that's what I wanna see in 15 years. Hi everyone, I'm Stacy Thompson, the Executive Director at Livable Streets Alliance. Um, and, you know, just to, to, to shift gears, um, it's a tough year. You know, 2020 is not what we expected. Um, this is not the kind of celebration I thought I would be having with all of you in December. Um, but, you know, we also believe that it's an inflection moment and uh, that we need to look toward the future. And we need to remember that the pre-COVID status quo was inequitable and unsustainable. And so the theme for tonight and the speakers who were chosen tonight are here because they have a bold and unflinching vision for what our future needs to look like. Um, you know, Livable Streets is 15 years old and we're gonna, we're gonna throw out some fun facts throughout the evening. But um, when we were started, our founding board members were told that our vision for bike networks for bus networks were impossible. And now we are accelerating. We're a national leader. Um, and so I'm very excited to have a conversation um, in what feels like an impossible moment with all of you about the impossible things we are all going to achieve together um, in the next 15 years. So we're going to start off tonight uh, with the video message from uh, one of our elected leaders who had really wanted to be here tonight, but who is um, literally in Washington trying to get us more funding for the T. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn things over to a video message from Senator Ed Markey. Hi, I'm Senator Ed Markey. And while I wish we could be together in person, I am just so delighted to virtually participate in this street talk on the future of transportation. And I wanna thank Livable Streets for hosting this important event. And I congratulate you on your 15th anniversary. Uh, everyone here understands that our roads and our sidewalks are far more than a means of transportation. They are a means of economic growth and community development, and they should be accessible for everyone. During the coronavirus pandemic, we are seeing more than ever just how important alternative forms of transportation are for safe and healthy travel. Biking and walking allow people to safely socially distance and to move around without needing to rely on gas guzzling automobiles. Unfortunately, our ability to rely on these transportation alternatives is threatened by a national safety crisis on our streets. Pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities increased by nearly 51 percent between 2009 and 2018. And these tragic fatality rates demand strong, strong action. And that's why I've introduced the Complete Streets Act. What is a complete street? Well, it's one designed to provide safe and accessible transportation options for all modes of travel, including pedestrians, bicyclists, and public transit users. I have also introduced the Connecting America's Active Transportation System Act, legislation that dedicates $500 million annually to connect walking and biking infrastructure into active transportation networks that allow people to reach destinations within a community, as well as travel between communities, all without ever needing a car. I believe that these investments are critical for improving safety on the road. And at the same time, these programs also present an enormous opportunity to lead the world into a new era of green transportation. That's why providing alternatives to driving must be an essential part of any effort to combat climate change. That's also why, in addition to my biking and walking legislation, I have introduced the Freedom to Move Act with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Our legislation will use federal funding 
to promote fair, free public transit systems across the country, which will reduce our reliance on cars while providing greater equity in our ability to access our work, our schools, and other critical services. In the months ahead, Congress is poised to make massive investments in infrastructure, both as part of an economic stimulus package and through our regular reauthorization of federal surface transportation programs. These major infrastructure packages are our opportunity to achieve a transportation transformation in this country. I look forward to working with livable streets to build a green, equitable, and safe future for everyone on the road. That has to be our vision for the 21st century, and I'm looking forward to partnering with every one of you to accomplish that goal. Thank you. We got a big, we have a big job to do, but it's nice to know that we've got some folks in Washington helping us out. Um, and as we transition to our first conversation tonight with Mary Jo Curtitone um, of Somerville, I just want to throw out our first poll question for the night. Um, we're going to be popping these out throughout the evening. This first question is just a little bit of a pop quiz about um, uh, how many miles of bike lanes were there about 15 years ago um, when Livable Streets was founded and when Mayor Joe uh, became mayor of Somerville. So welcome to the Street Talk. We are so excited to have you. And my first question for you tonight is, um, you know, you've been mayor almost as long as Livable Streets has existed, but we have the sort of the same time frame. And, you know, I, I would just love for you to help the audience understand what your community and the world looked like 15 years ago. And um, what were some of the impossible transportation related things that people pushed against you, said were impossible, and you, you sort of pushed through the fray and got done? Well, thanks, Stacey. And, um... It's an honor to be here and good to be, you know, good evening to everyone tuning in. And it's an honor to follow Senator Markey. Um, uh, you know, I do want to spe send a special shout out to every activist and advocate out there, especially those uh, and from Summerville, who, when you mention, uh, you know, fighting against claims of impossibility and unwillingness to meet our mobility goals led the charge. You know, but for folks in other communities, you know, please know that I serve as the uh, chairperson of the Metropolitan Mayor's Art Coalition, which is the 15 communities surrounding the inner core of Boston. And I represent 21 inner core uh, cities and towns at the Boston MPO. So I'm truly proud and honored to uh, be your partner, to be your champion, because uh, as you've alluded to our region systemic inequities uh, simply cannot be solved one municipality at a time. Uh, Chelsea's success is some of the success, Quincy's needs are some of those needs and we're all in this together and we've suffered on the transportation front and many other uh, fronts on housing, our response to this pandemic from years of provincialism, parochialism, and we need to be all tied in together. So, so let's pretend it's 2004 and I, I just took office as mayor and regarding mass transit, the Green Line extension was actually a legal obligation of the Commonwealth then, but there was no permitting no design, um, no finance plan. Some of it was you know, led by a coalition of stakeholders and partnered, uh, partnered with MassDOT to get into the Fed, get it in the federal funding pipeline. So you, know, you asked me about crazy idea, and here's one. Uh, some of those Union Square Green Line stop was not even part of the project, the GLX project in 2004. It was neighbors, business owners, advocates, activists, the community had to push and push and fight to get Union Square into the conversation for light rail service. So today that station is actually taking shape and we expect revenue service in mid 2021. I'm really proud that we leverage the transit investment to build affordable housing, uh, human, uh, human uh, skilled streets and new public spaces. In Assembly Square, the 2004 era plans did not include mass transit. Uh, we conceived the idea of an orange line station in 2006 or so, again, led by advocates and activists like the Mystic View Task Force. Uh, in fact, back then, Massachusetts, when we opened up the station, hadn't built a new rail transit station since 1985 uh, here in the so-called one of the most progressive states in the United States. So literally, people told me, told us we were off our rocker. Uh, state officials said to me, quote unquote, uh, not only is a new subway station unrealistic, um, I would just don't want it, so you're not going to get it. So some of them challenged that. We challenged them on what we could accomplish together. And, uh, and, and our housing goals, our environmental goals, our economic goals. I mean, we ran with the crazy idea of building a coalition of community organizers and public agencies and private sector partners to actually make it happen. 
and uh, don't even get me started on bus transit. <laughs> I'm so pleased that our region has finally started moving the needle on, on bus mobility. Uh, you know, Somerville, like other communities, has been a leader on bus mobility uh, these past few years. Uh, but I will admit that public officials had a very different and very limited understanding of bus mobility in 2004. I, I wish we could have started our bus renaissance uh, just a few years earlier. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor Joe. And yeah, you know, I, I, I just don't think, I think it's hard for folks to realize when they get off on assembly, go shopping, go to their apartment that like, literally 15 years ago that was like not even conceived it was it was deemed fully impossible it's one of my favorite stories um and i i want to talk a little bit more about the mbta but i'm curious if we've um received enough poll uh responses yet to answer with the what what do we get can we get the responses um popping up somewhere okay right excellent so the answer is less than a mile um uh, when Livable Streets was founded, there was less than a mile of actual bike lanes in Boston. Um, and uh, about half of you got that right, which is good. But I think it's indicative, um, uh, you know, when you think about what we saw in Connect Historic Boston went down like that, like we saw miles of bike lanes go down in communities like Somerville and Boston and throughout, met, you know, the metro area just this year alone, we started with nothing and we were told that we would never, ever, ever achieve a bike network. So, you know, just, it, it's gotten a lot better. Um, but on that note, um, I got to ask you about the MBTA because uh, it's on everyone's mind tonight. Uh, you have been a fierce opponent of the potential service cuts um, since day one. And I don't want to get too bogged down in those, but um, I want to know what you think. And I want to know, you know, what you think. I know you're not going to say the T should be cutting service. So I want to know what both what you think about the cuts and what you think we need to be doing instead to again, have that truly sort of visionary approach to transit in the region. Thanks, and I know you've been working close to our talented staff on this, so you know that since March, some of them has taken a consistently conservative approach to flattening the curve of COVID-19 to save lives. So I start this conversation by asking how our healthcare system and essential services can keep running uh, without reliable and robust mass transit. And the next question uh, is really about equity. Uh, so I think this moment really, and you would agree, requires people in power to be very clear that decades of systemic racism have placed unique uh, burdens on our region's communities of color. Uh, the people with the longest transit commutes uh, are disproportionately our frontline workers, whether in healthcare or logistics, and they're not working the white collar jobs, they're not working virtual. The most durable ridership on the MBTA system during the emergency has been documented and uh, frankly, in our, our black and our, and, our, and our brown neighborhoods. So is this really any surprise given what we know about structural racism in housing and education, food access and childcare? Without reliable mass transit, I don't know how anyone can but struggle to see how Metro Boston can manage this pandemic or build a more equitable economic recovery because this is not about getting back to normal. You said it at your opening comments. Normal was us unsustainable. We were the most, we, we reached the status of the most densely, uh, most congested traffic region in the United States prior to this pandemic. Normal was equitable and it was unhealthy. So Massachusetts needs more transit. I mean, certainly not less. And our infrastructure is crumbling, we know that. And our best choices seem to be shift capital spending to operating. So I said, we need really a new set of funding mechanisms to break the cycle of our managing crisis to crisis at the T. And we really need to continue to think of this as a, a regional issue. I mentioned this at the beginning. We suffer from generations of parochialism, provincialism, especially in Metro Boston. And we've seen this in response to the pandemic where 351 cities and towns across the Commonwealth have to come up with their own plan. And certainly it's been the case around when we think about planning a transit and mobility future that was equitable and clean and for everyone. Um, Many Boston, uh, Metro Boston residents commutes aren't limited to their cities and towns, however. A bus line cut in Boston, uh, as you can imagine, could affect communities, uh, communities in Abing, uh, Arlington and Cambridge and Somerville or Medford and beyond. And we really all need to be advocating for more service across the T system. So I'm cautiously optimistic uh, about what I heard at yesterday's MBTA uh, board meeting. Uh, but we do have a long way to go, and I want to appreciate all the advocacy and those who spoke up and activism against those cuts. And the work you do on livable streets is propelling us forward on that path. So thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I do want to throw one more question at you tonight. I know you have another meeting you have to run to, um, but I really appreciate the regional approach that um, Somerville takes because, as you know, you're you know you're surrounded by other cities and towns, um, and I've never had a conversation with you or your staff um, where you aren't thinking about your neighbors and you aren't thinking about the most vulnerable and the people who rely on the services that go to and through your community. Um, and I, you know, I would say candidly, as an advocate. Um, we will push when we need to, but our, we prefer to work with. And um, it was our privilege to work with your team um, on a number, just a, an enormous number of street related projects in the last year. Um, bike lanes went down, a number of tactical interventions went in to make it safer for people to walk and access goods and services. I think three different bus projects. And yeah, I just, um, we often have to fight with municipalities to get them to take this stuff seriously. We never have to fight you know, with you to at least start in a good place to say, we gotta make our streets work for everyone. And I just wanna hear more about why Somerville sort of took this approach in this moment. Great, well, thank you for saying so. And I, I first wanna shout out the incredibly talented staff we have here uh, in the mobility division, first led by the OSTC, uh, the Office of Strategic Planning Community Development Director, George Proakis, and the head of mobility, Brad Ross and his team, but the countless advocates, advocates and activists in the city and around the region. And really it's in our DNA. So I need to thank, uh, say thank you to our residents who advocated for a robust COVID-19 mobility strategy in, in Somerville. So one part of the answer is that our constituents demand safe uh, distance mobility options. Another part is that cities and towns across the world quickly shared knowledge and inspired one another to really solve uh, urgent challenges. It's really at the city and city regions, I, I find uh, you will discover the most practical and prudent leadership in bold decision making. Uh, in the springtime, our staff were, uh, they were closely studying national and international peer cities. Uh, Liberal Streets hosted a webinar featuring, uh, as you know, Montreal's transportation director, Merci. And so we, we quickly customized the best practices uh, to some of those contexts. But it just, uh, it wasn't just the NACDO network that inspired us. Uh, there were plenty of great ideas right here close to home. Uh, we borrowed from Brookline and Salem for commercial district sidewalk widening. We studied Waltham uh, and Boston on outdoor dining. And not that I'm biased, uh, but I think that frankly, some of those 10 mile residential shared streets program was the uh, most robust and innovative in the region and kudos to our community and Brad and his team. But in all seriousness, the thing I'm most proud of is keeping attention uh, on the public health crisis uh, and the, uh, through the lens of structural racism. So that's why when uh, MassDOT offered grant funding uh, to cities and towns for quick build uh, shared streets projects, some of them proposed bus lanes and not cafe tables. Don't get me wrong. We, we, knew, we knew we'd figured out the cafe table issue, but our residents in the region needed a spotlight on transportation equity and on transportation's role in perpetuating, uh, addressing the perpetuating health disparities. And some of them had, really had the strategic plans in place to compete for funding. So we have great partnerships uh, with the staff of the MBTA and we, and we knew where bus ridership was durable and where crowding um, could actually be better managed using bus lanes. And one of those projects was completed last week, uh, just this past week in Union Square and another is being installed today in East Somerville and that third is scheduled for next week in Winter Hill. So for us, uh, really the work is not done and COVID is raging as we all know and continues to disproportionately impact our most marginalized residents. So I'm afraid that we must continue to really innovate and uh, improvise uh, because frankly, uh, you know, lives and livelihoods are, are gonna depend on it. Awesome. Um, I know we're already two minutes over our time with you. So I just want to say thank you so much um, for joining us tonight. You know, as you said, uh, we still have a lot of work to do, right? It can feel good to look back on 15 years, but uh, we're excited to work with you and the city of Somerville on, on the next 15. Yeah, and we're excited to work with all of you um, and for the entire region. We can do this. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Stay safe, folks. Thanks for having me.
Um, so I uh, would really, I'm gonna turn things over to our panel now. And while we are um, in our moment of transition uh, to bring our, our panel live, we're gonna go to our second poll, which should have popped up now. And this is um, about today. How many miles of bus lanes has Metro uh, Boston implemented in 2020? Um, so this is so far this year um, in just the, the last 12 months or so. Uh, and I think, um, I think I'm seeing our panelists here. So I would love to jump in. Um, like I said tonight, you know, we wanted to kick off with, with Mayor Joe and sort of talk about what's going on in his community. But what he described is what has happening across the country. Um, uh, issues of structural racism, issues of inequity that have long predated our, um, you know, our current crisis. Um, but then also to bring national leaders in and local leaders to talk about how we, we need to have a vision for the future and we need to move forward. Uh, and so I'm gonna um, direct my first question tonight to uh, I think a familiar face and a close partner of Louisville Streets for several years, Mary from the Bar Foundation. Um, I know you've been at it you know, a, a, a while, a few years. And I wanna ask you the same question that I started with Mayor Joe. Um, what did the world look like 10 or 15 years ago? And, um, and what, uh, what were you told was impossible as you were thinking about granting, I don't know, wild and crazy organizations like Livable Streets that, that didn't have staff yet? <laughs> Take yeah. it away, Mary. Hi, Stacy. Well, thank you for the invitation to participate in Street Talks and congratulations to Livable Streets Alliance for 15 wonderful years. And if we start to track a lot of the progress we've made on transportation and mobility, you'd see it track nicely with how long Livable Streets has been around. So congratulations. When, so I'm at the Bar Foundation in Boston and we focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation and clean energy sector. A lot of the work I fund is around the transportation and land use components. And 15 years ago, um, one of the wackiest ideas was we didn't have bike share. Like we really did not have bike share in this Commonwealth. And, you know, it was advocates. And I know you guys were sort of, you know, in your infancy, but you know, organizations like yours and others said, why do we not have bike share? Why are we not doing this? And so that was one of the things that seemed like it was far fetched, particularly when you think about winter and you think about you know, where you're gonna place them and all of that now to look you know, fast forward, it's not even an issue. Not only do you see bike share all over the city and the Commonwealth, you actually see, them, see it being used in the winter. I think the second like really wacky idea was could we think about bus differently? Would it be possible for us to redesign the bus so that it did a couple of things. Number one, that it addressed this inequity because we recognized, and it's the point that Mayor Cototoni was saying, is that he recognized that there's this inequality in our transit system and this structural racism and the bus in many respects had been, has been and had been neglected for decades. And so there was a lack of dignity and a lack of you know, access, a lack of sort of you know, consistency in the bus that we really said, well, what if we completely reimagine the bus and reimagined it so that it runs like you see in other parts of the United States where they're trying to, you know, do bus rapid transit. They've done it in Hartford, you know, Houston just passed the big bond bill to pass that, what we're starting to see percolate all over the world. And so those were two big ideas that seemed almost improbable that now you look back and you're like, gosh, if we, if we had done them sooner, we're, I'm happy we've done them now, but it's changed the whole transportation landscape for us here. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. As someone who rode a bike share bike every day in the winter to get to our office when the, the city was shut down, I can say um, I did not think when I moved here 12 years ago that would be the case. Um, but you know, shifting gears and bringing on our next speaker, uh, I should have known better because I grew up in Minnesota and uh, Minnesota has some of the best biking in the country, including year round biking. And it's in, due in no small, small part to our streets, Minnesota. Um, and so I, I wanna turn the tables over uh, to you, Ash, um, and ask, you know, um, 
we want to have a visionary and hopeful conversation, but, uh, you know, as I mentioned, like we, we can't, um, ignore the current moment. And I know it has been a tough year. It's been a tough year for you in Minnesota. And I would just love to hear more about how you, um, have approached your work, both needing to meet the moment and needing to look for the future. So welcome. Thank you, Stacy. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really great to be here and great to hear from both Mayor and you, Mary. Um, so a little bit about uh, me and my organization. My name is Ash Narayanan and I am the executive director of Our Streets Minneapolis. So we are uh, a nonprofit based in the Cedar Riverside of uh, neighborhood of Minneapolis. And our mission is to make the city a better place for people biking, walking and rolling, something that's very familiar to all of you. So um, a little history about our organization. We started back in 2009 as the Minneapolis Bicycle Coalition. Uh, and back then, uh, much like you, know, you and the mayor were describing, uh, Stacy, uh, Minneapolis didn't have a lot of bike infrastructure. And today, uh, you know, we are consistently ranked among the top biking cities in the US. And a lot of that is a result of the organizing that was done by folks involved with the Bike Coalition. Uh, in addition to you know, really strong leadership from elected officials, uh, as well as some really ex excellent work by public works staff within the uh, Minneapolis Public Works Department. Um, and so, uh, yeah, four years ago, the coalition changed its name to uh, Our Streets Minneapolis. So uh, to also affirm our commitment to people uh, uh, walking and rolling as well, rolling meaning people in wheelchairs and uh, micro mobility. Um, I myself came to Our Streets Minneapolis in 2019 uh, as the executive director. And before that, I'd worked uh, at, uh, in Wisconsin, where I focused uh, at another nonprofit on, on moving money away from major highway expansion projects and into transit, biking, and walking. Uh, and my background is in civil and transportation engineering. So, uh, you know, a little bit about, you know, our main, today, I think our main driving value is justice in transportation. Uh, Mary, you mentioned, you know, structural racism. And so, we really try to prioritize and highlight the voices of those who've been left behind in transportation decision-making, black indigenous people of color, people with disabilities, immigrants, uh, people who are trans. Uh, so um, yeah, our major uh, program area is uh, our, our advocacy program, which is where we are a grassroots organizer, where we advocate um, you know, amongst residents of Minneapolis to put people first on our streets. Um, and we also, uh, along with the city of Minneapolis, run the Open Streets program, uh, which is probably our most high profile uh, program, uh, which draws uh, major streets in the city. Are, we shut them down to cars over the summer uh, and we open them up to people. And so we have, you know, uh, folks, you know, dancing and we have food and we have, um, you know, all, all kinds of things happen. There. It's, it's just a really powerful vision of what our streets could be if they were designed for people and not just cars. Um, and we had about 100,000 people attend last year. So uh, Stacy, to your question about 2020, um, it was indeed a tough year for us. We had to cancel our open streets events and we also had to shut down any in-person community organizing. Um, we had major community gathering uh, events planned and of course none of them could happen. Uh, and then in May, uh, the Minneapolis Police Department killed George Floyd. And so this year, you know, really exposed in our, in my opinion, uh, who really has power in when it comes to transportation decision making in the city of Minneapolis. Um, so when COVID first became a thing, you know, we immediately saw calls for a network of streets to be shut down to allow for people to safely recreate and exercise while practicing social distancing. Um, and in theory, we always support streets that you know are more people centric and less car centric. Uh, but this time, you know, uh, as a small nonprofit with limited resources, we decided that we were not going to necessarily add our voices for the call for open streets. And instead, um, you know, we, we realized that there already exists. A lot of it is because of the work that we've done in the past, but just a really powerful network of people, people who are clued into how advocacy works, uh, people who know the right levers to pull. Uh, many of these people have been part of our organization and worked with us on advocacy campaigns. Um, but we also noticed that, you know, calls for that were mostly coming from wealthier, perhaps whiter neighborhoods uh, who, especially from folks who may have had the privilege of being able to work from home. Uh, and, you know, without us even asking for it, the city of Minneapolis closed a network of streets called them Stay Healthy Streets, which I think did a really good job of giving people uh, room to socially distance and recreate. Um, so instead, what we did, uh, we noticed that people who were more likely to be essential workers, 
um, who tended to be from neighborhoods who, which also lacked really good access to biking, walking, and transit. Um, we focused instead on kind of listening deeply to what community members needed at that time. And our own staff were on the streets helping coordinate uh, with, with the community. Uh, we advocated for better PPE. At the time, there was a shortage. Um, and this is just kind of an example of how we are thinking of advocacy going forward. We think that major transportation decisions must take into account any previous harm that's been done to communities, people who've been left out, uh, and make sure that any policy or budget position we take is done in concert with the community partners we're choosing to prioritize. And so uh, I'll, I'll just quickly stop there and uh, yeah, turn it back to you, Steve. Thanks. Thanks. There's so much to unpack there. I love it. Um, you know, we first connected on some of these issues around what does it mean to actually prioritize the voices that haven't had a seat at the table. So I'm I'm pumped to dig in more tonight with you. Um, but before we do that, I don't want to forget the poll because um, we are going to tra uh, transition to a transit leader. Um, okay, we y'all we didn't quite get it. We've we've built 14 miles of busways um, in in Metro Boston in the last year. Only one in four of you got that. I expected more from you, you transit advocates. Um, all right, what I'm gonna, I wanna bring in Laura um, from LA. LA was my last trip before the pandemic. I was jealous of how wide and straight your roads were. I just thought about the future of bus rapid transit. I was like, I'd kill for this much space. Um, but I'm so excited to have you here tonight because ACT LA sort of takes an integrated complex approach like livable streets. You focus on transit and transportation, you focus on housing, you focus on climate, any one of those issues could be 15 organizations. Um, and I'm sure you've been told that trying to tackle it all together at the same time is impossible. Um, so I'd love for you to share a little bit more about why you're choosing to do an impossible job. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question, Stacey. Um, no, Act LA, so we are, we're a broad coalition in Los Angeles County, which is a county of 88 cities, um, 11 million people. And our coalition, we're 38 community organizations. So we actually do have a lot of capacity. Um, we've got organizations working on tenant protections, affordable housing, active transportation, pedestrian safety. Um, we have worker centers that are part of our coalition. And the coalition formed by, it was formed by community organizations. And before it had staff, it was really a labor of love of a number of different organizations around LA. And the reason why ACT LA formed, we also formed in um, 2009, was because Los Angeles is seeing a massive uh, investment in transportation. We have $160 billion investment into our metro system. Um, and it's, a, it's the biggest infrastructure project in the country by far. And the coalition leaders at the time really saw an opportunity for community groups to get out ahead of these development questions and uh, prioritize things like affordable housing and tenant protections as our system was being built out and whole new rail lines were going in and the bus is being redesigned. Um, and so it was a, it was a visionary um, undertaking. And over the last 11 years, um, we have been able to have a very integrated approach with how we, we approach development. Um, really having communities of color, workers, you know, organizations representing um, people who depend on transit, um, you know, really setting out, okay, this is how LA needs to develop with this massive um, $160 billion investment. Um, and so a few things that we've prioritized is making sure that when um, any zoning is being changed around transit stops, because that's been a huge conversation in, in Los Angeles is how to change zoning to, to you know, go from our very sprawling region to a more dense transit oriented um, development pattern. So as we're changing zoning to make sure we're requiring deeply affordable housing to come along with those zone changes. And so what ACT LA led on is we put a ballot measure forward that we won in 2016 that requires deeply affordable housing with, with any more dense um, development near transit. And that has actually become the um, biggest source of affordable housing in California. Uh, and so that's been a successful model. We've also worked um, with LA Metro on creating a transit oriented communities policy, which passed in 2018. Um, actually our implementation plan of that just passed through the board last month. 
Um, and that's going to that's going to um, put a lot of resources from LA Metro into working with our 88 cities that are part of our our um, transit authority to um, work with Metro on uh, working on housing policy and tenant protections in those various cities. So it's going to um, put technical assistance um, from Metro as well as um, budget for for um, helping create new policies for housing um, and protect um, transit riders. And uh, the the reason why we work in this way is, um, you know, we're not going to reach California's ambitious climate goals without a, a serious transformation in how Los Angeles moves. Uh, Los Angeles transportation is uh, one of the biggest climate emitters in, in the state. And so we need to transform how Los Angeles moves, but we are not, we're actually going in the opposite direction. Right now we have a 25, we've had a 25% drop in bus ridership over the last 10 years. Um, so we're, it's, it's uh, we, we really need to make, and, and part of the reason why that has happened is because of gentrification and displacement and um, people who have been able to live in, in the urban center and use the bus to get around have been forced out um, of the urban center. And so we're, um, we know that gentrification is one of the reasons we've seen this drop in ridership and we need to make sure we're, we are um, very aggressive on tenant protections as well as creating more affordable housing for people to, to live by the system. Awesome. Thank you. I was so excited when we had our initial conversation. As many folks know, we brought in a Great Neighborhoods, a housing focused program uh, into the streets about six months ago. And I was just saying, you know, it's so we, we have a serious displacement crisis. And you were like, here's a playbook for building deeply affordable housing right next to transit. And I was like, I can't believe I'm looking at LA for this. I'm as an East Coaster, you know, we're like, we're like embarrassed. Uh, but it's it's amazing. I'm I'm so jealous. I, I, I'm going to steal your playbook and we're going to do it here. Um, <laughs> But you know, one one thing I want to turn um, uh, this conversation over, you know, for a little bit of a group conversation. And note, I have seen the question about what are we going to do in the next fifteen years, and we are getting there. Don't worry, we're also going to talk about how to get cars off of our streets. Um, but before we get there, in all of our prep conversations, in a, in some of the 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 questions we got tonight from the audience in advance. Um, one thing that was pervasive across all of all of the experience of the questions was how do we overcome entrenched bureaucracy? Um, there are too many layers of government. There are outdated public processes. There's complicated funding mechanisms. And that while we may have great ambitions to do big things in 15 years, it's just too complicated that we hit you know, uh, bureaucratic and political barriers over and over and over again. So um, looking to you, believing that we can do big things in the next few years, um, what do we need to do to get break through these barriers? And Mary, I saw you take your mic off first. I'm going to throw it to you and then have Laura and Ash jump in. Thank you. Um, the one thing that we can do and that we do in philanthropy is fund your respective organizations. You need to have organizations on the ground like Livable Streets Alliance, like ACT LA and Our Streets Minnesota. You need those, those advocates that can say it matters in our communities, it matters for equity reasons, it matters for quality of life reasons, it matters for our climate goals. And so philanthropy has this unique role to play to support organizations like yourself, who not only are lifting up those, those aspects of transportation and the housing and the, you know, the mobility and the, and the placemaking, you're not just lifting those up, but you're, 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 you're creating a sense of accountability. You're asking your elected officials, this is not an option. We are going to ask it of you and then we're going to hold you accountable. I think the second thing that we have seen in all of the work we've supported is that you need one champion. You really need that one mayor. We've heard Mayor Curtitone. We also have Mayor Di Maria here in Everett, Massachusetts, who says we are gonna be the first municipality that does bus rapid transit. So you need to find that one champion whether it's a mayor or a municipal leader or, or you know, an advocate, but that one champion that says, this is the issue that we are going to sort of live and die on and do it over a consistent period of time. And then the third thing really that I think is important is to do the kind of public outreach that we know Liberal Streets Alliance does all the time, right? So that when you then wanna to move 
you know, your transport, you know, your rail project or your bus rapid transit, or you want to take a bike lane that you have already engaged the community. And they have said, this is the bike lane that we want. Oh, no, we don't need a bike lane. We need a bus lane. But your, your advocacy comes with the endorsement and the supportive community. And that's what you need to really deal with this entrenched bureaucracy. Um, so finding those three pieces are the ones that really have paid dividends for us here in Massachusetts and in greater Boston. Thank you so much, Mary. Laura, um, Ash, anything to add? <laughs> well, I would just say that um, we really need to make sure that riders' experiences is informing decision making. And it sounds like a simple idea, but it's actually <laughs> like it does take work to make sure that we're um, basing decision making by the agency on what is happening day to day on the system. Um, our, our Metro board and a lot of the staff, they're not regular transit users. Um, and so it, it takes a lot of work to make sure that transit riders get heard. Um, and so one of the things that we're, we've been asking for is actually having seats on the Metro board for transit riders. Um, we also have an organizing committee where we have the base building organizations that are part of our network. So, um, you know, community groups that have members and that 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 ride transit. So we've got an organizing group that we take our cues from. Um, and uh, the just the, the other thing I would say is like a lot of you know my analysis of our transit system comes from using the transit system every day. And so um, you know it's a, it's a, it's very different to read about long headways and sitting there you know with a with a forty five minute. Um, wait when you're late to a meeting or something like that. And so we really need to make sure that we're going out and, and collecting those experiences and having them heard by decision makers. Thank you. Thank you. Ash, anything yeah. to um, A lot of the things you're saying, Laura, resonate with me as well. Um, specifically in Minneapolis, we have so many different jurisdictions who have responsibility for what our streets look and feel like. Um, just in Minneapolis alone, there's the city of Minneapolis that you know controls a whole bunch of streets, but there's also Hennepin County, which is the county that the city lies in. Uh, there's the State Department of Transportation that operates freeways and a whole bunch of other uh, arterial streets within the city. Uh, there's Metro Transit, that this is a transit agency that serves the seven county Twin Cities region that Minneapolis is part of. Um, and so it, you know, um, I think the city of Minneapolis has done a pretty good job of, of, of raising the bar in terms of what our streets should look like. We have a really ambitious transportation action plan uh, that will guide transportation decision making in the city for the next 10 years that was just adopted by city council. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, an interesting statistic is just that like 9% of the total street network um, of, of the worst streets in our city, uh, which the city calls the high injury crash network, are responsible for 70% of the worst crashes. Um, and uh, half of those streets are actually outside of the control of the city of Minneapolis. They're owned by Hennepin County. And so most people who live in Minneapolis don't even know that they uh, that the city doesn't control these things. So one of the things we've been trying to do is raise awareness of who the right people are to contact when your city street needs to be made better for people living along it. Um, and so we have a new campaign called um, County Streets for People uh, that's really trying to build a movement of people who live, work, and play along these really, you know, along these county streets and 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 get elected officials to take action. One other challenge is that the that only three out of seven Hennepin County commissioners are actually based in the city of Minneapolis. And so uh, we have to find ways to build a truly a citywide movement and then also get support from folks outside of the, of the county as well. So that's what we're trying to do. And uh, yeah, we're back to you. Awesome, thank you. I'm gonna take five more minutes before we turn things over to Bob because I do wanna to touch on a couple of topics about sort of what's next and what are the things that we're being told are impossible right now. Um, but I just wanna summarize a little bit because you know I think it always seems so obvious, but um, I think what we've heard over and over and over again is that we are only making, making progress because we are actually engaging people. <laughs> we are actually building a movement and that, you know, maybe there's a singular story or a pretty picture that gets all the attention, but I've only heard from everyone tonight that it's about the hard work of talking to neighbors, building a movement and that like bureaucracy <laughs> crumbles in the face of, as you saw 2000 emails to the fiscal and control management board in the last week. Um, so hot tip, build a movement um, and, and join us. Um, but so I'm going to touch on two topics and then we're going to do Q&A. And the first one is something that um, Ash and Laura and I talked about quite a bit. Um, 
uh, is what does it mean to take enforcement out of Vision Zero and on our streets? What does it mean to decriminalize transit? Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, I'm talking about the issue of policing and enforcement in our streets, but this is a, a conversation that goes back and forth, right? You hear people say, it's impossible to defund the police. What do you mean? And I believe that we can take enforcement and take police out of our streets and make them safer. And I believe that we can decriminalize <laughs> the experience of riding and transit and that those are real and achievable. Um, and Ash and, and Laura, you both are looking at this in, in different ways. And I would love to just give you both a minute um, to say, you know, like, what does that actually practically mean in the next, in the next um, year or 10 years from your perspective? Laura, maybe jump in. Yep, sure. Yeah, so this is an issue we are all in on right now. We um, have $800 million of policing contracts in LA Metro alone. Um, and so over, over a five year period, um, and that's that's hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to policing rather than improving our system, um, rather than outreach workers for people in need on the system, rather than things like a transit ambassador program um, and actually staffing and providing a high level a level of service to transit riders. Um, and so we um, we got a, a motion. We worked with um, our metro board on a motion this past June. And that motion um, formed a public safety advisory committee at LA Metro that is looking at alternatives um, to move money out of the police contracts into alternative safety, um, alter alternative safety measures. And our, our shared goal is a safe system. Um, but what we see as safety is like really people feeling safe, black riders feeling safe rather than feeling targeted. And what we hear time and time again is that black riders feel very targeted by the way fair enforcement is done. And we actually have data that shows that black riders are targeted more. Um, and so um, we are committed to, um, you know, creating these, these type of programs like outreach workers to work with unhoused people in the system and actually connect them to res resources rather than policing them. Um, and, you know, so, so that, that safety advisory committee is starting in January and we're going to be working on that um, all winter and would love to keep sharing ideas about, um, you know, what, what, what different cities are doing and how this conversation is going. Awesome. Um, and for folks in Massachusetts, it um, we still have not decriminalized fare evasion in the state of Massachusetts. There is something we are trying to do that right now, but I would note this is not uh, this is everywhere. Um, but Ash, I know you're also thinking about what this means for our streets. Yeah, um, and as you know, you know, Minneapolis has been really kind of the nerve center for a lot of the defund the police conversations uh, over the last uh, year. Um, you know, we at our streets Minneapolis have been calling for removing enforcement from transportation for years now. And then the killing of George Floyd only kind of accelerated and made more urgent that call. Uh, it, it, this uh, uh, policing is just another layer on top of the history of, of exclusion and marginalization um, of people on, on in transportation. And so a um, couple of, uh, Stacey, you asked about, you know, immediate next steps. You know, the couple of things that we are right now calling for is one is removing any uh, enforcement from the Vision Zero program. Uh, the Vision Zero plan was just recently adopted by the city and it calls for increasing traffic enforcement and, re and evaluating the recreation of a, a city of Minneapolis traffic police unit. Uh, so we're asking for that to be removed. And then um, the, uh, the new transportation action plan also calls for uh, implementing automated um, traffic cameras throughout the city uh, or in, in some parts of the city, which we think Again, is um, you know it, we're worried about surveillance and we're worried about a disproportionate impact on people of color, especially. And we think that there are just much better ways to make our system safer than enforcement. Awesome, thank you. Can I add something to that? Because when Massachusetts started to look at its transit fare evasion, what they actually found it was that it was the commuter rail riders, the wealthier riders, that were actually evading fares. And so I want to make sure that as we think talk about who is actually doing the most egregious act, it often is are not your brown and black people. So I, I think it's important to lift that up. And then the second thing around it is you should never criminalize somebody needing to get to work, needing to get to school, needing to get to their hospital or whatever it is that they're trying to go. So there's a problem with the very concept that if you need to get somewhere um, and you don't have the resources that somehow you were being criminalized. So I think those are two distinct conversations that are worth lifting up. Yes. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, and 
I am I am going to have us talk about our last question, but I want to bring Bob C on first, who just joined us. Um, at, at our Ritual Street Talks, Bob turns the tables on me um, and, and puts his reporter hat on and asks the hard questions. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Bob, for a few minutes. Okay, thank you, Stacy. I don't know how hard these questions are going to be, but um, thank you for inviting me. And I just wanted to say how lucky we are to have organizations like Livable Streets and so many other transit advocacy groups in the Boston area and Massachusetts. And yes, the MBTA is hearing the message, by the way. So keep up the good work. Uh, I remember, Stacy, you know, covering these issues about making our streets more livable for the past couple of years in the face of crushing traffic and cars everywhere, the worst congestion. And then something completely unexpected happened, COVID-19. And it completely changed everything. And I have two questions about that. One, have we been taking advantage of the situation to maximize what we can do to make our streets safer and more livable? And if not, what more could we be doing? Uh, great question. And as always, I'm gonna turn it a little bit and say at Livable Streets, we have been um, bullish about not saying that we should be taking advantage of or seeking opportunity in a pandemic. Instead, what we are saying is um, that, you know, our transit system is going off of a funding cliff. That was true before the pandemic. Our streets are unsafe and don't serve people well. And that was true before the pandemic. And what, what the pandemic has done has exacerbated in uh, um, already existing inequities. And if you are not investing in transit, if you are not creating safe spaces for people to access critical goods and services, getting to the hospital, being able to walk or bike to a grocery store, then you just aren't doing your job, <laughs> right? That th this is like mission critical for the equity and success of our urban and rural areas. Um, so we don't see it as an opportunity. We see it as a must do for anyone who takes equity seriously and, and economic recovery, frankly. Well, do you think you would have gotten those 14 miles of bus lanes without it? Heck yes. <laughs> <laughs> there he knows. Yeah, and we're gonna get 14 next year too. And we're gonna save the tea. Come on, Bob. <laughs> okay, so as the, the pandemic fades, the vaccines come along and the weather warms up and the traffic returns, how are we going to, to keep what we have without succumbing to the pressure of people who want to continue to drive. Perhaps more people will be driving because they don't want to use mass transit. So how do we hold on to the, the to what we've created? I'm gonna turn this over to Laura and Ash and, and Mary. Um, well, I think first and foremost is, is uh, we can't be cutting our transit system. Um, we've had a 20% bus cut here in Los Angeles, um, even though out of all the regions in the country like we've had the least drop in transit in bus ridership um and that's because it's our essential workers that are that are depending on bus um and so we've been real like showing up at every metro board meeting pleading with metro to reverse this decision because um we're really afraid if we lose transit riders now and people um you know purchase uh use cars or whatever it is um because of the um, increased unreliability of the system um, that we're not going to recover in the way that um, you're, you're talking about. Like we we want um, to have transportation be a key part of a just recovery in the region, um, and so we we need to reverse these cuts first and foremost. Yeah, I really agree with uh, Laura. I feel like transit systems across the country are facing huge huge crisis, and then you know this making sure that our core systems remain in place and that we're able to. Um, you know, help the recovery back with uh, making sure the core system still work is going to be really, really important. At the same time, you know, COVID has really shown us how uh, just laid bare, you know, the inequities in our society, um, whether it's housing, whether it's transportation. And so I feel like going forward, this is really a time for us to rebuild, thinking about the mistakes that we've made in the past, thinking about why certain people have been left out of the system, so thinking about why certain neighborhoods have worse traffic, um, you know, uh, traffic crashes and uh, congestion and, and um, particulate matter emissions and really thinking about, you know, the decisions we made in the past and what kind of future that we'd like to have um, and, and, you know, uh, focus our resources on making sure that we really build uh, a system that is inclusive of people going forward. Great. 
One of the things that COVID has shown us is that, as everyone has already said, that these inequities are, you know, they're right in front of us. But the other thing that COVID has shown us is that we are social beings. If you've seen all of those pictures, people still show up, they go to church, they're in concerts. They just had a picture of people literally wall, wall to wall looking at them, putting up the decorations of Rockefeller, the Christmas tree in Rockefeller Center. There is absolutely no evidence that public transit is a super spreader for COVID. We, that doesn't exist. If you look at places like Singapore and London and people where they were already riding public transit again, that is the myth that COVID is going to be spread in public transit. We have got to debunk that. But the second thing I think is really important to think about, I do not want us to build a, build a transit system just for transit dependent, just for low income, just for people of color. We need to build the best system we can and encourage everyone to ride it. That is what success is going to look like. If we keep marginalizing or sort of somehow segmenting the, the ridership, we are going to have a race to the bottom. And I do not believe that is what we're asking for. We're asking for exactly the opposite, for public transit to be the mode of choice and you have to build it so that it is attractive and it is a delight to use and people want to be on it. I'm just going to say, once you give it to the people, it's really hard to take it away. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're in a, a moment to where we're trying to save transit, but there, there, you know, there's been a lot of positive bu buzz, especially in Massachusetts. We're like, oh, you can eat outside. This feels good. We can, you can, we've seen so many families, so many videos of families biking around Boston Common. Like that happened this year. Um, I think it's going to, I think to the earlier point, if we have built a successful movement, people will demand that they will keep what they have worked so hard to achieve. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Bob. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna go to audience Q&A and what I'm gonna do is wrap what was supposed to be my last panelist question into one of the audience questions. Um, and it's about transit, but so, so someone from the audience was sort of like, yeah, yeah, you guys did a lot in the last 15 years, you know, like an entire bike share system, uh, bus rapid transit, an entire, you know, bike network that we're slowly building. Um, but what, what do we, what is the thing right now that 15 years from now we thought was impossible that we're talking about, um, that we will have achieved. Um, and so I'm also going to, um, put out a poll right now. So I, I put in a few things that livable streets is working on. Cause I'm curious what folks are most excited about because from a livable streets perspective, we are going to build a 200 mile seamless greenway system. We are going to build BRT and a bus network. We're going to fully expand it and we're working on free transit. It. I don't think that's crazy. <laughs> I think people need to actually have access to the system. Um, so, so those are the things I'm excited about that I believe we will achieve. But I'm going to hand this over to the panel. Um, you know, what do we need to do in transit, and what are those what are those crazy things that we're going to 15 years from now be in like a I don't know like an AI virtual setting talking to each other again? <laughs> Stacy, I think we will absolutely have bus rapid transit. We will have a network of bus rapid transit that gets people where they need to go in a way that's efficient, effective, um, safe, uh, you know, great to use and build out a network. You, we can do it in this Commonwealth. We can do it for a fraction of the cost of what it would take for us to build out rail. I'm a big rail fan, but bus rapid transit and really a bus network expansion will enable us not just to deal with inner, you know, neighborhood or inner city tra travel, but also it enables us to address issues where communities have been gentrified, right? I mean, gentrification. And so as you're looking at more people being displaced to suburban and rural areas, we are gonna to have to think about expanding the bus network so that it reaches those people. So that's what I wanna see in 15 years. Actually, give me 10, I wanna see it in 10. Five, Mary, we're gonna do it in five. Yeah, yeah, let's do it in five, right? <laughs> uh, Laura, what about, what about you? Yeah, now this is actually a question we worked on with uh, community leaders that are part of our coalition and we came up with a long term vision and it's really based around um, this vision of LA going from having a transit system that's underfunded and unreliable and really a safety net for people that don't have cars. Um, to actually a, a very high quality world class transit system that's fair free and that Los Angeles is very proud of so like everybody's proud that we've done this transformation. 
Um, that that's our vision. Um, we want it to be integrated into um, people's daily lives, and yeah, we want it to be the mode of choice and um, address our our horrible congestion here. Um, so that's our long term vision, and we do think fare free is is very much possible. In fact, we have a, a committee in LA Metro right now, appointed by the CEO of LA Metro. Um, that's working on looking at this question of, of making the system free. And one of the things that the CEO um, raises when, when we talk about this is um, just how much they spend on the fair system, right? Fair collection, all the tap cards, all the, um, you know, uh, the turnstiles and, you know, just having to go and collect the money. And that actually costs quite a lot of money in addition to the enforcement, right? That $800 million budget that um, I mentioned earlier. And so it's very expensive to collect fares and we're actually not getting that much fare box recovery. So he he believes that this is possible. Um, so we're all in on fare free transit here in LA and I think we will see it soon. Awesome, you know, we're full supporters. We've done an analysis that shows two cents on the gas tax can make buses st free statewide. There's a billion dollar fare collection transformation process here. And we're like, are we gonna spend a billion dollars on that? Or maybe, maybe there's a future where Everyone, regardless of age, race, or income, can safely, effectively, and efficiently get on transit anywhere in the state. That feels good. Um, Ash, what about you? What is Minnesota going to look like in 15 years? <laughs> yeah, uh, speaking for Minneapolis, you know, um, we the, the transportation plan that was just adopted by city council has a, a goal of having three out of every five trips being made by mode other than single occupancy vehicle by 2030, which I think is a pretty ambitious goal. and to really get to our climate and equity uh, goals. But personally, the things that I would like to see, one is you know, us exploring a network of car-free streets within the city. Um, we, we don't really have that. And I think there's just some, some talk about that um, you know, happening around uh, places in, in, in Minneapolis. And then maybe there's one more thing. I know you only asked for one, but I do think we have to reconsider the role of freeways within our cities. Um, you know, they've really uh, been a huge barrier uh, for, for, you know, neighborhoods and communities, especially black neighborhoods that have been destroyed for the creation of those freeways. And uh, now those freeways are reaching the end of their life. And we think this may be an opportunity for us to start thinking about what may be in, a, in their place if they were in there or if they were converted to something else. Awesome. Uh, I love hearing that. I'm going to go to a few other questions. If you guys are game, we got about, about five minutes before we wrap up. Um, I, and I think all of this is achievable. Like I said, I do. I'm curious if we have some re results from the poll of what people are most excited about who are at least watching tonight. Um, ah, almost even split. <laughs> Uh, interesting, interesting. Okay, so we'll just do it all. Um, we're gonna have a bus network, free transit, and the Emerald Network. Um, <laughs> I was like really hoping for one there, but we're just we're gonna do all the things. Um, so I'm gonna ask uh, one. We I just want to share. We did get a, a comment from from YouTube. Someone said it's so strange to hear all of this from a European perspective. <laughs> Um, you know, it sets, uh, we love to be, you know, believe we're first in the world, but if you, you know, I'm not aware of any European country that is looking at cutting transit by 20 or 30 or 40% right now, right? Like that isn't even a question. So wh why are we doing that, right? We, we should be making sure everyone just can get where they need to go. Um, so a, a couple of questions that I have to end, um, to end on tonight. One is hyper-local. We had a couple of questions uh, before this and one directed at Mayor Cardotone um, and uh, uh, I couldn't give it to him because he had to run just around like, how do we get cars off our streets? Like, you know, we sort of said it and, and, it's, and it's this question, it's like, we still allocate a ton of um, uh, uh, space to parking. What does it mean? You know, from my perspective, you have to build everything else first. <laughs> you really have to have walking, biking, start making those trade-offs. We're in the messy middle. But I'm curious when someone asks you, like, how do we do this? How do you respond to that? And then on the flip side, um, we did have someone ask, what is the most important uh, thing to be thinking about as the Biden administration takes over? What do we need from the federal government, from federal leadership to make our municipalities successful? So I don't care which of those questions you all respond to, but I would, I'd love to hear. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if anyone wants to jump right in. Sure, I can uh, go first this time. Um, you know, in terms of when we, uh, in terms of getting cars off of our streets, I think there's just, a, there's a whole bunch of things that cities can do. Uh, but, you know, at the very outset, I think we need to start implementing 
the priorities and the values that we say we have as a city. For example, you know, we have a complete streets plan and the plan lays out a very clear hierarchy of what kind of modes we'd like to prioritize. So, you know, we want to say we want people like walking first and then uh, people uh, biking and then people using transit and then single occupancy vehicles. You know, that's not really the, uh, that's not how our streets are laid out today. The vast majority of our streets are dedicated to the movement and storage of cars. And so in the creation of, of new uh, street reconstruction projects, if we genuinely uh, listen to what our complete streets policy says, we would allocate space accordingly. And so making sure we have amazing pedestrian infrastructure, protected bike lanes, and then the remaining being given over to cars. Uh, and then we, you know, we obviously we subsidize a whole bunch of um, car centric infrastructure through parking garages and, um, uh, you know, freeways and uh, the, the gas tax just doesn't pay for all the uh, car infrastructure that we subsidize. And so sharing that more equitably, giving more of that money to public transit, funding transit equally, funding biking, walking equally, I think will go a long way towards uh, removing cars off our street. And then uh, what was the second question again? Uh, federal government. We have a new administration. Oh, yeah, um, you know, we've we've heard a lot about the the Green New Deal, and I don't know if we'll get a Green New Deal in the next couple of years. But if we do, uh, you know, I think it absolutely should prioritize reducing car dependency and reducing driving in our cities. And I think any major federal stimulus project should also include retrofitting our streets within our cities to really kind of make sure that they are putting people first, that they have good walking, biking rolling infrastructure, good transit infrastructure, um, and, uh, you know, federal, federal stimulus should, should prioritize our street design and make sure we reduce car, car dependency on our streets. So those are my two things. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to build off of what Ash just said, because I agree with absolutely everything he said and recognize that we are in a moment in time where we will soon have a federal administration that not only believes in climate, they are committed to doing what we need to do to, to keep our greenhouse gas reductions down. And we cannot achieve that goal without really prioritizing public transit. When you look at buses, even if a bus is 28% at capacity, it still produces 33% less emissions than a single occupancy vehicle. Like it is a no brainer. And so I do think it's leaning into the values and say, what do we want our cities and our municipalities to look like? How do we you know, make sure that we are prioritizing those low carbon ways of transit and no longer have this conversation about when we're doing any kind of projects that we're gonna prioritize vehicles. I just think we need to make a decision that that is no longer gonna be the way we plan our cities. Um, Laura? Yeah, I agree with everything my co-panelists have have raised. Um, and the only thing I would add in terms of the Biden administration is we really need a renter bailout. Uh, we have here in LA, we have about over, we have over 300,000 uh, renters that haven't been able to pay rent because of stay at home orders um, and they just can't work. And so people don't have the money, they're not paying rent. Um, we have people now with months of rent debt racked up. Um, and if this isn't addressed and this leads to mass evictions, we're going to see a lot of our core transit riders in Los Angeles displaced out of out of the region. Um, and so we, we need to be, you know, again, like looking at these issues of transit and housing is very, very interlinked and be um, thinking about how to protect renters and how to stabilize um, people in very precarious housing situations right now. Thank you. I'm going to take liberties to answer this question too, because it's a street talk. Um, you know, I, I, I would agree with everything that folks said. Um, and I would just add that, um, it's really important for our local and state legislators to keep taking action, even if the Fed, like it, it is all connected, right? So we first need relief, desperately need relief for our transit systems, rent relief, just like true relief. We're gonna need stimulus. And then we're going to need an infrastructure bill <laughs> and we're going to need to talk to our even even the best intentioned legislators are going to need to hear from us over and over and over again that the formulas they developed during the Reagan administration don't work for us anymore and that they need to change those formulas right like they still need to hear from us we still need to bug them in the state of Massachusetts we need our state legislature to pass a transportation bond bill and to pass a revenue bill so that we actually have matching funds for when the feds come we need to have plans on the ground um, so that we can build bus rapid transit we can build 
rail, regional rail. Um, and then our mayors and our local electeds need to be ready to build that stuff in, in their towns and cities and towns, right? And so it's this, um, we have to do it literally from every street corner to Washington, where hopefully our, you know, maybe our future president will be getting on Amtrak to go to work, which is, you know, can you imagine? Um, but it, it like really starts, right? Any piece of that puzzle um, falls out, then, then we, we lose something, right? And so I think this is a moment where we do need to be focused on your street corner all the way to Washington. Um, all right, we're very close to time. I know there were some questions we didn't get to. Uh, I just want to ask, I, 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 you know, I have some closing remarks, but I just want to know, is there anything else folks want to add from the panel? Anything else? You guys, you guys did an amazing job. Any closing inspiration? <laughs> Well, I would just say, and thanks again for hosting this. This is a great conversation, Stacey, and thanks for having ACT LA represented here. Um, that like to, to really kind of uh, press reset on how transit riders are viewed. Um, you know, transit riders, they're really climate heroes. They're addressing climate emissions, uh, sorry, um, carbon emissions, um, addressing traffic congestion, and also activating public space. And so we really need to be making these decisions about mobility from that perspective of like supporting transit riders in everything they need. We talked a lot about how different things were just 15 years ago. And I think that is incredibly inspiring uh, thinking about the future, how quickly things can change. Uh, we just need, you know, the right champions. We need to build a movement. That's all. That's what all of us are doing. Um, and we, I really do see change, like massive, drastic change, being possible in the very near future if we, uh, if we actually build build the will to do it. So that's that's kind of my closing. And I'm just going to wrap up by saying we could not do this work without the leaders that we have on this call, right? Um, the, the advocacy, Ash and Laura and Stacy, and what you do every day, and you show up, you show up in the right ways, you lift up the values that are really important from a perspective of equity and climate and quality of life. And so from the, you know, from the Bar Foundation and from the perspective of philanthropy, this work really is happening because of your leadership. So I just want to lift that up and say shout out to your work. And, you know, I'm just delighted to, that you're in this space. Thank you so much, Mary and Laura and Ash. I, I would agree. It, um, it has felt really good over the past year to be able to connect with partners across the country and to know that we're not in this alone and that this is a national movement. Of course, I want Boston and Boston area to be leading the national movement, um, but we'll take some competition on free transit from Laura, from getting enforcement out of our streets and true complete streets uh, from, from Minneapolis. Like, let's let's take it. We'll, we'll take you down. Um, no, no, we'll do it together. Um, anyway, I just, I want to thank our speakers tonight. I want to thank Mayor Joe. I, I especially just want to shout out GBH, um, who uh, in April, when we reached out and said, hey, we have this crazy idea to do a bunch of street talks. The, the team at GBH Forum really stepped in, experimented with us, helped us bring you this amazing programming. Um, they have a website. They're, they probably produced hundreds of these uh, at, you know, in, the, in the last few months. So check it out. Um, and I also just want to shout out, it is our 15th anniversary. I want to thank our amazing staff, um, my team who's put these events together, our board. Um, and we have 10,000 people in our listserv, 10,000 members um, who actually send those action alerts. We're sending a couple tomorrow, um, who make sure that we we are saving transit, that we're building biking and transit. Um, so just thank you. I, I look forward to celebrating all of you, maybe next year together in the Old South Meeting House. Uh, but until then, I look forward to seeing you online, on Twitter, um, and in the fight. Thanks so much. <laughs>